Dale, welcome to the show. Fantastic to have you here today. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to have an episode on sales. I actually love sales. I think there's a very strong misconception in the world about it being pushy or what have you. I think it's all about matchmaking and hearing what people's needs are all about. So super excited to dive in. And I'd love to start with why sales rebellion? I know you talk a lot about rebellion, sales rebellion. So tell me what's behind that. Yeah, I came up with the the name as I was deep diving around the mission of what it was that we wanted to stand for. And I realized that 90% or more of our ideals are unpopular inside of the sales world. Um, you know, one example would be that it, when I tell people it's more important to give an experience than to make uh, a massive amount of cold calls. Sales leaders tend to get a little timid by that statement, or, you know, they get a little uptight, I should say, probably better way to describe it, thinking, well, why are you telling my people not to do a massive amount of calls, but instead to give a better experience, whatever that means? And, you know, so I slowly realized that we are we are a narrative that is very unpopular uh, inside of the sales world. And ultimately, because of that, we are a rebellion that's fighting against the status quo. Nice. And I think it's interesting, this idea of giving an experience. Can you explain a bit more what that means to you in sales, giving someone like an experience and not just yeah. a massive amount of sales calls? <laughs> yeah, happy to. I, I feel that uh, in most cases, sales is looked at as a numbers game, uh, which I'm not a fan of. I think that, sure, there are odds and statistics in all things in life. But with odds and statistics as well, too, it's, you know, it's always based off of segments right? Or it's based off of somebody else's experiences. And, and so my personal experiences are that in the early days of my sales career, I did a lot of cold calls, tons of them, door knocking, phone calls, I did it all. And, uh, you know, there were days when I'd get back to the office and brag and say, like, you know, I, I knocked on 50 doors today. And, and that was looked at as hard work and good work ethic, but also like, where were the results? And, Sure, like when you when you call on 50 people in a day, you're bound to find one or two opportunities, so to speak. But if the experience that I'm giving those people is that, hey, I'm a cold caller in the copier space trying to sell you a copy machine, then I, I'm not necessarily the most valuable thing to that person. And because of the experience I'm giving them, they're most likely going to lump me into a, in their own mind, a group and that group will typically be crappy salesperson or just another salesperson would be probably a nicer way to say that. Uh, and and so I started to say to myself, well, how do I stand out differently to individuals like this? And I started with what is kind of popular in our rebellion as the uh, called as the, the letter campaign. So this is an example of it. I show this one because the crumpled letter itself, which is what most people know us for, the crumpled letter uh it's hard to kind of like see the envelope and understand like the aesthetic because it's a it's a literal crumpled piece of paper, right? But on this, you can actually see like that I've stained this coast this uh, envelope with a, with a coffee stain and called it a coaster over here. So so the idea is is that like if this shows up on your desk, it's curious, it's it's different, it's engaging, it tells a story. Someone's gonna open it and read it. And when the messaging is kind of like, hey, look, you get a lot of sales calls. I wanted to be a helpful salesperson, and so I at least made it to where you can turn this sales garbage into a coaster for your coffee. But maybe also you'll think of me every time you put down your morning cup of joe. Who knows? And you know, there's some fun, entertaining bullet points in there as well too, in regards to like what we fix. But everything we base everything around like the the feeling we give people. So even in the way that we describe things or talk about our business, we really talk about other people. We talk about other people's experiences. We talk about other people's problems in a fun and more nurturing way than saying things like, yeah, you know, saying it like a pain, I guess would be the best way to, to, to state that. So in most instances, sellers like to spout out like three, four different pains as they like to, to call them that somebody is suffering through. Well, why in God's name would I want to have a conversation with you around a, a stranger, around a problem that I'm having? And yeah, for sure, there are definitely 
times when you can say something like, yeah, most people I talk to are suffering from X and have tried Y, but they get Z outcome and it's not what they desire. And I help with those things. And sure, there'll be somebody on the other line occasionally that says like, yeah, I, you know, I could use a little help in that realm, but look, I, every salesperson out there listening to this right now are just human. I'm telling you right now that psychology tells us that those moments are not what you think. In most cases, that person is responding because you have triggered something um, an insecurity is what has been triggered in the moment. And ultimately it's a very surface level interaction. And I can have that same interaction with the next sales guy that calls too, if he says the same thing, right? But I can't have the same interaction with that person that I have with the guy that drops off the copy stand letter. His interaction will be different. Her interaction will be different. And so because of that, we stand out from the crowd. Our experience is something that is unforgettable, not just memorable but something that nobody ever forgets. And 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 the copy saying is a fun one, right? But like, these are some cards I used to pass. I don't know how much of this is going to be visual, but I'm holding a business card that's the size of a four by six so my hands in front of it. And it's a pretty big card. And so imagine instead of like handing somebody a typical business card, you hand them this big four by six card and it's me fighting a copy machine with a sword and there's literal health bars at the top of a video game. And it says fatality and KO on it. And, and so if I drop this off for an IT person who in the standard of the world, you know, in the way that the culture and society works, typically as a gamer, as a nerd, that's why people get into IT in most cases. They don't like tech. They love uh, fantasy. They love sci-fi. They, it's part of the process, right? It's, it's, a, it's a stereotype, but it's a very accurate one. Um, so if I hand this to an IT person, this speaks to them differently and engages them differently and gives them a much better experience. But even like if I drop a small business card off, if the business card is a picture of a baby on a changing station on top of a copy machine that has a built-in pancake maker and espresso machine and an oven in the bottom, I have something different than everybody else. So even when I'm when I'm being more standardized in my experience or typical, if you will, I'm still creating a moment of radical education in the person that is experiencing what it is that I'm doing to them. I'm causing emotional context and a stir up of emotions. I'm creating what we know as a sense of wonder, which can take people to places of nostalgia. Ultimately, it is a place that is very nice that people like to go. Instead of this transactional moment of, hey, I fixed this problem and you can hire me to do that. Well, the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, that the person who's having the problem in the first place has most likely tried to fix that problem before, or the vendor that they're currently using has promised to fix that problem, but never quite made it to the finish line. So why in God's name should they trust you to do the same thing? And, and I'm not saying that you can't, uh, you can't win and that you can't create those outcomes for people. What I'm saying is, is that most people will be hesitant and reluctant in those moments. But if I'm giving experiences, showing ingenuity, showing creativity, problem solving, if I'm giving them something to latch to a story to tell, a future state that we want to achieve together, and I'm doing it through methodology that ignites the brain instead of creates stagnant places where the brain lives, I'm going to have a better outcome than anybody else. Even if I still am told no, it'll be the best no that you ever heard in your entire existence. <laughs> That's something to aim for. I love this. I, I think it's true that this idea that if you just insist on people's pain points, I remember when someone re reached out to me or I reached out to them anyway, but it was a sales call and they're finishing with, and of course I've studied sales for my own business. So I also know what they're doing and they finish, but yes, but you do realize if you don't fix this in, you know, three months from now, this and that will be worse. And I'm thinking, how <laughs> on earth will that get me to close the fact that I'm finishing on a low point, on an extra pain point after I'm already not convinced about the service. And then I just finish irritated. And I think it's true that sometimes at the right moment, in the right way, you know, realizing the person can realize it's a pain point for them and can be extra motivated, obviously, for this pain point to be solved. But it has to be quite tactful. <laughs> you can't just sort of throw it at the end. By the way, this is all the pain you'll get if you don't sign up. So, yes, I think that having this sense of wonder and play. So how do you, once the person is open, let's say, they see this creativity, they see this playfulness, they see the wonder, how do you then go from this initial stage of maybe curiosity, awareness, vague interest 
into actually them becoming a client? Yeah, so and this is a great question because a lot of people say this feels more like relationship selling. And and the problem with relationship selling is that most people get stuck so deeply in the relationship they have a hard time asking for things. I think this stems to a place that we can all relate to. So anybody that's listening that's had a relationship with another human being in their life, it can be a, a myriad of different relationships, right? But uh, let's take a complicated one. Like you said, you were married. I've been married for 17 years this March, uh, March 24th, if anybody wants to send me a gift. <laughs> all gifts welcome. Um, my wife and I have also been together for 21 years this uh, September so or August. So we've been together for a very long time. And in that relationship, there there is only one way to ultimately get better, grow stronger, and become unified in those 20 plus years. And that is to be highly communicative with one another as to what it is that we desire, whether they're personal desires, their desires that we did, we have for each other or for our kids, whatever the case. Communication is like the key to that. And this is this what it boils down to is communication. So if I'm being creative, I have to communicate ultimately what it is that I can help you with. And and here's the thing is that I'm not communicating. And I'm not saying I can help you with these things necessarily. What I'm doing is I'm painting this picture. So if I'm selling copy machines, I'm saying things like, hey, uh, I saw that Jessica is in accounting. And I know that today it's Friday. So I just wanted to call on and make sure that she's not having a hard time running checks through the infamous bypass tray of the existing copy machine and getting like streaks and lines or like errors when she hits print every time she goes to get that down because people got to get paid today. Am I right? And the person that uh, on the phone that I'm talking to will literally go, where well, do you know somebody here? How did you know that we have those problems? But these are the thing is, is that they're standard issues. So inside of all of our businesses, we have this one thing that we fix. It doesn't mean that our, like my equipment has the same problems. Sometimes the thing is, is that we understand where the root of the problem is. And so because of that, we fix it a little bit differently than the big box store, because the big box store thinks that if they spend too much time training and micromanaging certain issues that, you know, the idea is, is that people become complacent. But if they also think that if someone's picking up with a problem constantly, that it's actually good for them, believe it or not. Right. So there's, there's a little bit of a misconception sometimes between vendor um, you know, a buyer and in some instances. And and so like, because in my industry, I understood these things, it was easy for me to not just talk about them at, at, not as if I didn't have the same problems myself, but talk about them in a way to say like, hey, we've got like a workaround for those kind of things. And let me show you how we do it a little bit different. But you get to that point, right? In the beginning, you just start in places where you know that people are having the issue and that you have a better outcome, not just like this problem that you can say, well, mine... You know, maybe mine won't do that as much, <laughs> but instead where you have more creative outcomes that flow with it. So if I can start a conversation in that place, it's easier for me to do things like say, hey, well, let me show you a little bit about how we can help with that issue. And and that's asking for the business, right? Because if you're sitting there and, and showing someone, well, this is how we do it. Well, what do you think? Well, I think it's definitely better than the way that we're doing. Well, Okay. Does that mean that we should do business or does that mean that you you just like the way we do it, but there's still some hurdles? And again, like direct, clear, raw, concise communication is very important. So instead of the moves and the plays and the beating around the bush, like allowing somebody to tell you what it is that they want to be decisive about in regards to how you can help them with something. And then just straight asking people, well, in my world, when you say, yeah, that sounds good, that means Hey, Dale, get the paperwork, bring it over, let's sign it, have a donut and some coffee together, talk a little bit more about your time and your metal band, and 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 we'll get this thing started. I think the problem is, is that most people have a hard time doing that because they think to themselves, just like in their relationships, they think, well, if I ask for that, what's the response going to be? Okay, so if I, like... If my wife has had like a really hard day and I was to say something like, hey, do you want to sit out on the back porch with me? When I know she doesn't really like to sit out on the back porch, that's kind of a selfish ask. Should I even ask it in the first place? Well, there's a way to frame that question still. There's a way to still be clear and communicative. There's a way to say, hey, I know you've had a really rough day and you don't want to sit on the back porch and watch me smoke a cigar while you just hang out with me. You know, I, I know you probably want some silence and this and that and the other, but is it too much to ask if I could just get you for like five minutes so we can chat and I can like, you know, hear your voice and hear about your bad day and, and then you can go inside and do your thing. You know, like there's, again, there's ways to communicate this kind of stuff. We typically tend to just avoid it. And and the reasons for that is that most people are accommodating. 
we're accommodated by nature in most cases, even when we're people that are very like selfish by nature as well too, like narcissistic even, we still have this accommodation theory where we think we want to allow people to do things that they might like. You know, and and sure, there could be like ulterior motives to that in some instances as well, too. So be careful about what I'm saying here. But again, it boils down to this idea that because of that accommodation theory and factor and that we're all built in with, we tend to do things like avoid conflict or not say certain things because we think in our head and have built a narrative around something that's false and not true that we'll get a bad response from it. So I I think in my mind that if, well, if I try to convert this coffee coaster person from meeting and presentation to sale without them just coming to me and saying, hey, we're ready to go, I might ruin the relationship there. But what what, what really happens is, is I, I ruin the relationship by not being forthright, blunt, and honest in the first place. And because that person then starts to think they can do whatever they want inside of that relationship, which means that they think that they can do that with anybody that they're around. But if just like I'm saying this in regards to, or I'm stating this in regards to like the way that we need to treat a buyer, we as sellers need the same thing as well. Sometimes like we need a buyer to say, Hey, I'm not going to ghost you for the next three weeks, but I am going to not talk to you because I really don't need you right now, but at least for the next three weeks to have some other stuff to do. And, and if I don't, and if it's like that turns into six weeks, please just like respect my time and, and don't call me and bump your emails and ask me if I'm okay. And why haven't I gotten back to you? Like, I just, I need some, like, I need some time. We we also need as sellers that same type of clear communication from people as well. So, well, look, the only way to get that is to do it yourself. So, if I'm freely speaking to another human, regardless of their personality, if they're accommodating, whatever, they're quiet. If I'm being very blunt and bold and honest, they will do the same to me. So, I thought it was a big, huge answer to the short question, but it is a complicated issue, and and it really stems around this identity of what communication is how we carry it out on a daily basis in our personal lives and our professional lives and what people deserve in those moments. Cause what they typically get from salespeople are lies, deceit. They get, you know, thrown under the rug in some instances, you know, because the salesperson doesn't like how quickly the deal's going. So they go to your boss and tell on you. And, you know, there's all kinds of different things that they typically experience with salespeople. And so we have to be very careful and understand that side of communication and what people are typically experiencing and be more bold and blunt and raw because that's where honesty lives. And the more honest we can be with each other and with people, the better the relationship. This approach of being honest and blunt and raw is really refreshing. And also what you said from the buyer's perspective, I've thought many times if I can get, and this is my aim, <laughs> at the end of a sales call, a clear no, it would be heaven. I'm like, I need to change my pitch or talk or it's not really a pitch. It's more listening and answering their questions and, and then telling them how it could work. And if they could say, no, I'll think about it or maybe, and then you have to question and, you know, how to make it a win or, or book a second call, etc. If they could just say, you know what, right now it's a no. Wow. So good. So good. Music to my, as much music, I think is a yes, because this uncertainty, this maybe-ness, and there's the, I'll think about it where you're pretty sure it's a yes, but that's kind of rare. And then there's the, the maybe I'll think about it and you know it's a no. Uh, one of the things I know that I'm going to test in my, in my next sales call is the next time someone says a fake no and I know it's a no, <laughs> I'm going to say, okay, so what is it that will make you say no a few days from now when you reach out to me? So I've been meaning to ask that question. I always find it hard. But I think just like you said, just saying what's in the room. If you feel it's a no from them, get them to say it. It's also a weight off their mind. They don't have to wait three days and then write that email and say, you know what, but just get them to say and be like, hey, it's cool. And, you know, maybe I can put you in touch with someone else that's a better fit. Or maybe we can talk again in six months. Or maybe you're not interested in any coaching and training and you do your own stuff. It's cool. You know, I'm not actually upset by no's. I'm upset by maybes. <laughs> Because in the past, I used to bet everything I don't anymore on those maybes. And then when they were no, it was such a crush. So like crash, opposite of crush. And so, yes, I think if people could be just a little more honest, it's not people aren't really scared of a no or a rejection as much as we think. If it's done tactfully and for your reasons, because when people say no, it's for their own reasons. It often has nothing to do with the person. So 
Yeah, that would be good. I want to move on to, to something uh, slightly different, but still in the sales process. Uh, I've coached a, lot, coached a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs who really struggle with, well, sales, that's one thing, but also with the prospecting and lead generation. I'm curious, what are like two or three ways in which people don't think about or underestimate or don't do in terms of prospecting and lead gen? That if you were right now to coach a business owner and that was the main pain point, you'd be like, you know what, dum, dum, dum. of course it might depend on the business, but I'm just curious if you have any innovative ways of looking at lead gen and prospecting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's our bread and butter. So like we, we are a sales training organization, but the biggest reason that people typically bring us in, some of that umbrella lies, strategy, go to market concepts. There are a lot of things you know based on the sales topic in the first place. So a lot of organizations bring us in because we can ignite and spark their net new outcomes and and they're just general prospecting uh, behaviors. So what like one thing that we are are seeing as very popular right now that we're teaching that is getting great outcomes is getting back to the old school ways of prospecting. So right now, I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of, and this is, these are not stats that are public. These are my internal stats. I just want to say that somewhere in the ballpark of a rep sending about a thousand emails a week. The open rate of that will be less than 2% and the response rate will be less than 1%. And these are just, you know, kind of like the emails that are typically sent by salespeople, right? quick question in the subject line, things that that people have grown very accustomed to. It's like we, in sales, it's like we kind of teach people what to get used to. It is the thought process. So even when I show you this letter, some people say sometimes when I make that statement, they're like, well, what happens when everybody's sending a coffee letter? Well, we have seven letters in that campaign and we have a postcard campaign with a dozen letters attached to that. So like we have the ingenuity in regards to our own system, even that we always have something different for you, even if it feels similar. But here, here are the facts though. Ultimately, like email, think about this for a second. Email is like 30 years old in regards to its like general access. So like, I think the technology was created in the eighties, somewhere in the nineties, it became like, I have an email. People send me messages on a computer and I open an email. And it was supposed to be a new form of mail, right? Well, now it has become, you know, most people, they have a personal email that they don't give anybody just for convenience sake regarding logins to sites, right? To, oh, I want to like get some information on a mortgage, you know, and I don't want a bunch, you know, I don't want people having this email. I don't want, you know, I'm just going to like mark everything as spam that comes in here even, you know, it's almost like, a very bunkered place. Now it's not easy to get into someone's email. There's, there's our firewalls. There are all kinds of technologies that keep, I have them that keep people out of your email or in a specific place. And now think about the phone as well, too. The phone is, is a little bit older <laughs> than email. Uh, however, it was created as a way to communicate with people at distances much more effectively or quickly than the old variations of communication prior to, especially because in most cases, what people were looking for was a fix to certain things that were causing problems, someone dying, um, somebody needing help or attention, uh, a major event happening. And this idea that like you had to plan everything like two years out <laughs> because if you did it, no one would ever like know. Oh, well, they'd be like, oh, that happened like last week by the time they heard from you. It was a thought process. So so that's why phones were created, right? Like think about that for a second. What what happens in this generation, in our generation, what happens when the phone rings? There is a very high chance that it is a solicitor if it rings. However, if it gets something like a text message, it's either also, you know, a, a person selling health insurance <laughs> or it's one of your friends, right? So so ultimately there that like there's in the medium, there are ways like if I send a as an example, if I send a text message through my phone to somebody that doesn't have my phone number and it's a video, 
and the video starts with me like with my hand out like this or a thumbs down or even like I've got, you know, like some book that's I want someone to read or I have the coffee stained letter or if I'm creating something where someone sees it and then there's a spark of curiosity that happens, I have a higher probability of having someone hit play on that video in that text message than I have of getting an email open after a thousand of them. <laughs> right. It's the thought process. So what we are teaching people is like, it's simple. I just took us through this whole rigmarole. Everybody's listening, going, okay, okay. I think I hear what you're saying. The world is noisy. Original forms of communication like the mail are not. And they still act the same way that they always have, which is that they relay information from one place to the next. So if you think less about being someone's spam, and you think more about building a relationship through the experience that you give and ultimately providing something to somebody that they might need at some point in time, but that not really being the focal point of why you're reaching out because they're, they're somebody that could be part of your network that could open doors for you just as much as they could buy something for you from you. If I'm thinking like that, I'm getting back to a more human, more raw, more basic form of speaking with people, of reaching out to people, of giving people experiences of doing what it is that I do as a salesperson, and which is to be able to be a servant leader to all, right? A servant leader is not somebody that sends a thousand emails a week, uh, per, you know, basically asking people like, hey, if I can have 15 minutes of your time, I can show you how I can do this, this, and this for your company. It's like, nobody cares. Same with phone calls, same with email, or uh, same with text messages that are spam in nature. So we've gotten people back to this idea of literally giving in-person experiences. You know, imagine you drop off a laptop and you you open it. You're like, what is this? You open it and the keyboard's all missing. And there's like taped to the screen what looks like a fire that's been drawn with like crayons. And there's a little note inside. And it's like, hey, does when you get on your laptop, does it ever feel like this? You know, then it is your IT support, you know, kind of lacking in the area of being able to help you fix it in a quick and efficient manner. If if so, you know, I'm here to help. And if not, then just like have a good laugh and throw this away. And I hope you never forget me. My name's Dale, by the way. And it's simple. It's a simple concept. And it's really detachment from the outcome and ultimately giving people something that they deserve, right? People don't deserve to be spammed all day. People don't deserve to, to be annoyed and solicited all day. Nobody deserves that. People deserve a good experience. They deserve to be able to check out from the mundane for a minute in the way that they're interacting with you. They deserve to be able to see something that could potentially and truly help their business in a different light than just thinking, yeah, well, why don't we just go ahead and get four bids on this since we got a cold call from this guy and see if anybody's got anything new out there. But instead, to be able to be ignited with ideas, with this sense of yearning and longing to do better inside of their own organizations and thinking that, well, this is less of a salesperson and more of like, I'm hiring somebody to come on board and help me to fix these issues. We've got away from the core principles and mindsets of what it is to truly help and serve people. And I think that's one of the biggest issues and why so many go to market strategies or the way that people do outreach sucks in this day and age. A lot of people don't like hearing this because they say, well, what are my BDRs and SDRs supposed to do? We have BDRs and SDRs in our system that send hundreds of letters uh, on a monthly basis to people and then are making phone calls and sending emails behind them that get opened that get responded to, that, that create interactions with people because we're doing something different and providing something outside of the box. The other problem with go-to-market strategies and this general outreach is that most people just tend to, to like download a list off Zoom and freaking go. And that's crazy. And, or, you know, and, and the problem is that most of these data companies like Zoom Info or whoever you're getting your data from, I'm not crapping on just one of them, but they all are kind of like in the same boat for me in that you type in some variables and I want people manufacturing this and that. They pull from data sets that have not been cleansed. They like for the most part, what you're getting is old data. It's stuff that, you know, some point somehow they got their hands on. And if they have new stuff, they have new stuff. And occasionally you'll talk to somebody that's relevant. Well, the problem is is that like there's too much convenience to that. Well, if I can just pay this company twenty thousand dollars to have a list of eighty billion people that I can reach out to. Like, wow, that sounds really good. And I can just upload that to my CRM and bada boom, bada bing. That's an issue. Like salespeople, the whole point of a salesperson is to be involved, entrenched, and ingrained into the community. Right. And by just like downloading the list, we haven't really done anything. I see I love watching people like do their cold call videos where they're like, hey, you know, am I speaking to so and so? Like this is a sales call. Can I have 30 seconds? You know, if you're feeling lucky. I think that that kind of stuff is fun and entertaining, but I always laugh to myself and think, 
most of the people that they're calling on, they have no idea who they are. They did no research. They There's no real cleansing process. They're trusting data sets to tell them, like, these are your prospects. And that sucks. Instead of just really, like, altering the thought process and saying, well, don't I want quality? Like, if I could call on 100 people that use my product for sure, right, even if they have somebody else, and even if only eight of the 100 will actually convert within the next six months, wouldn't that be a better list than these thousands of people that you're sending messages to that are just marking you as spam, deleting you, ignoring you, not responding to you? Like to me, we have it so backwards in the way that we want something so badly as salespeople. And and we're and we're chasing because of that. We're never living in abundance. We live in scarcity because of it. So so, you know, again, that is a more of a more of a, like a thoughtful answer than anything, but the sauce really is getting back to the idea of connecting one on one with people, giving one person at a time an experience that impacts them, that creates responses for you and outcomes. Because sales should not be measured on metrics. If I have people sending a thousand emails a week, I'm screwing up. I need to, be, those people need to be having 15 conversations a week. That's what needs to be happening. Good or bad, they need to be having 15 conversations a week because that will convert, right? The thousand emails won't. <laughs> so we got to start thinking a little bit more gravely about that and get to a better place. What I'm hearing from what you're saying is really going from this impersonal sort of approach to sales with the thousands of emails to exactly a more personal, more tailored, more creative, more innovative. And more kind of I want to say calmer somehow like not like more thought through I think that's the word it's not calm it's more thought through like you're really thinking about what would light up that person's day what would be a quick way of you know getting them to smile or laugh or get some form of emotional reaction and this idea of playfulness so that they're interested intrigued curious and at least you make an impression and then they might want to do business together or not but you're, you're setting off on um, a fun way. I think it's also about being authentic to yourself in the sense that no one wants to spam a thousand people. Like nobody, no one wakes up on a Monday morning and it's like, let me send a thousand emails to most people I don't know and spend my day uh, on calls with people who hardly know me to like shove my product or service in their face. No one wants to do that. But people do want to play. People do want to interact. People do want to have these deeper connections. So it's coming back to a sense of authenticity and deep connection, which is also one of my core whys. I know I say one of them. It's my core why. It's one aspect of my core why is this idea of deep and authentic connection. So I, I truly see things in the same light. Amazing. I realize we're already approaching the last few minutes. What would be the last piece of uh, advice or inspiration that you feel would make today's episode complete? Yeah, I think for the most part, the things that we've talked about have been kind of like a reevaluation of the standard or the basics around how we operate as salespeople. So I, what comes to mind is encouragement to individuals who might be struggling right now to grow their businesses through sales efforts or to expand their community uh, in regards to the way that they're reaching out and what they're doing. I, I would encourage people to start thinking less inside the box. I would encourage people to start understanding that there's a lot of opportunity out there in, in non-traditional ways through unconventional thought. I would encourage people to, like you said, be a lot more authentic, right? Like I, I was explaining this business card uh, and talking about how I sell to nerds when I sold copiers and I would I accommodated that. And But I'm also the thing I, that maybe you figured out, maybe you didn't. I too am a nerd. <laughs> and so it's easy. For, I'm not faking that that card is not, you know, me like pretending to be into video games. Like I am literally a nerd. And so it's easy for me to wear the 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 sleeve, if you will, of the copier warrior, the moniker of the copier warrior that I created as a personal brand. And and really the people will connect more with humans than they will with your corporate company and organization, right? So if you tell somebody, hi, I'm with ABC company, they don't care. If you tell somebody that at XYZ company, we fix this thing, they don't care. But if there's a little bit more of a personal approach to it, and if ultimately you're speaking with somebody in more of a direct way, because remember when we talked about communication, we talked about bold, blunt, honesty, directness, 
right? So if we're getting back to those roots, back to those basics, back to the simplicity of life, and then, you know, not trying to cover everything up with this business centric mentality, everybody says things like, oh, it's not very business like, or that's not very professional. Well, what is, right? What is the standard of professionalism? You know, firing 17% of your workforce without telling them right? With no severance? Is it the sexual harassment cases that I hear constantly from the the women in my circles? Is that the standard of professionalism and business that we live by today? You know, in my opinion, we have got, we have used that concept as a cop out for ourselves to be able to be legendary in our walks. Instead, we have become vanilla, bland and boring, you know, little meat sacks that walk around and can recite the company policies and speak the script that they've told us to do over and over again. Like break free from that, be more of yourself, rebel against the status quo of those things. Stop worrying about what people will think about you and start remembering that the person that you're going after in regards to the business that you you seek to serve, the person that is there, remember the word, right? Person, like they're a human. They're not a corporate shill or a robot. They're a human being. They watch Netflix at the end of the day or HBO Max or Hulu or whatever, right? Like they like to laugh. They eat normal food. They like to hang out with friends or they're more of an introvert like yourself, maybe listening as well too. And they need that downtime every once in a while. They're a normal thing and they're operating as a human on this earth for the next hopefully 80 to 100 years of life, you know, and enjoying what it is that's put in front of them. Stop thinking any other way around, uh, about it because when you do, your life will suck too. And and one to leave for for everybody out here, um, I, I would challenge you to, we, we have this concept of choosing legendary inside of the sales rebellion. And so what I would challenge you to do is to take one person inside of, from a sales perspective, one person inside of your funnel, if you will, or your 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 prospecting efforts, or maybe it's a person that isn't responding to you and hasn't for like six weeks. Think about the things that Katie and I talked about on this podcast just now in regards to clear communication, better experiences, being more mindful, being being open to risk and discomfort in order to like ignite something in somebody else. Pick one person and just for the sake of it and humoring us and the time that we spent together on this podcast, just do something different and see if you can get their attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dale. I've learned a ton. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Pleasure. Thank you.